winter, but it's summer outside. Feels good. Uh, but uh, here we are, the beginning of November at lunch with a genius. And so thank you for taking time out of your schedules uh, to be with us. We have some folks online as well that are joining us with Zoom. Uh, and, and so for those on Zoom, when we get to Q&A, you can go ahead and type in your questions and Angie will read those uh, as needed. But thank you for being here. We always start uh, the Lunch with the Genius with uh, another genius who's our leader of the university. And he'll give us an update at the university. Please welcome Cliff Smart. Yeah, but fortunately, I've never had an IQ test. <laughs> Just prove that. But uh, uh, welcome. What a great weekend. Right? Yeah. What a great, what a great uh, weekend uh, to foundation board uh, meeting, alumni board meeting, board of governors meeting, wall of fame. What a, what a fabulous ceremony that is every year to recognize people with a combined uh, total of hundreds of years of service to the university. And then the conclusion of the Onward Upward campaign that, as you all know, uh, raised 274 plus million dollars. Stephanie Smith threw a hell of a party uh, on Saturday night. I hope you got to be a part of that. It was uh, so much fun. And so uh, uh, that's the big news. Uh, on the Board of Governors side, we elected uh, a new leadership for next year, and so uh, Chris Waters will be our chair next year, uh, financial planner advisor from Kansas City area. Just had breakfast with him this morning, and we we're off to a good start there, and he's got uh, uh, good uh, supportive thoughts about the way the universe is going. Lynn Parman, who's the Chief Operating Officer for uh, NAIA, also uh, lives in North Kansas City, is our Vice Chair. And so starting in January, that will be uh, board leadership as we move into the, the next phase of, of whatever we do after the campaign. Brent, have you decided what we're doing after the campaign? Not yet, sir. All right. <laughs> Taking your own sweet time. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. And like 48 hours. Um, and, and the weekend, the, the highlight of the weekend, one of the highlights of the weekend was the dedication of the John Goodman Amphitheater Sunday afternoon. Uh, listening to our musical theater students both perform and talk about what this facility is going to mean to them for recruiting, uh, for performing, for having. Uh, a different level of opportunity uh, at the university to see kind of Josh Hitton unplugged and unscripted was really fun. He and his wife was here with him, had a tremendous weekend. They weren't, they weren't already submitted to us. I'm confident when they left, they were completely uh, uh, connected in the polls. And so uh, big hand to Brent Dunn who led that. And everything wraps up. And so uh, we now look to let's get through the semester. Uh, we start uh, basketball next week. The women lead off Monday night, University of Missouri. Very good team. We've been in three years in a row. And so I'm confident they'll come in uh, and give us a great game. Hope I will see you at Great Southern Bank Arena, six o'clock tip off Monday before the Lady Bears. Uh, and with that, I'll bring up Patricia White Minutes to introduce our program today. Welcome, everyone. My name is Leticia White Minnis. I am the Associate Dean of the McCrory College of Health and Human Services. Really excited to be here today with you all. We've got a lot of exciting things going on in our college. Um, the professional building now, the Camp Peter Hall. Um, has undergone a really exciting renovation. If you haven't seen it and you'd like to come over and see it, I would welcome you to give us a call or Brent can connect you to us. We'd love to give you a tour and show you everything we've got going on. Um, but let me get to the order of business. I'm really excited. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce our genius today, Dr. Amy Hollum. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Nebraska with majors in biological sciences and biochemistry. She completed her PhD in human genetics at the University of Michigan, studying mobile genetic elements. During her postdoc training, she studied HIV replication at Northwestern University. 
She joined the Department of Biomedical Sciences here at Missouri State in the fall of 2015. She's taught courses in biomolecular interactions, the biology of HIV and AIDS, personalized medicine, COVID-19, and virology. She's also continued to study how HIV infects cells working with undergraduate and graduate students in her lab. And she's brought one of her former students with her today to chat with us. She recently received a three-year R15 grant from the National Institute of Health, focused on providing opportunities for undergraduate researchers to study the role of cellular factors on HIV replication. Like many HIV researchers during the pandemic, she shifted the focus of her lab and performed COVID-19 wastewater testing to help us monitor the pandemic on our campus. And she did that from the fall of 20 through the spring of 2022. So I asked her, why HIV? I was just kind of curious. And I'll quote what she told me. She said, I've always found viruses, especially retroviruses like HIV, fascinating. Compared to other microorganisms that cause disease, viruses have a pretty simple makeup, but can cause a lot of problems. And viruses are often the exception to the rules for how cells function and information is transferred, which I think is fun to study. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Holland. Thank you, Dr. Holland. I'll put you right here. So, so uh, Amy, can I call you Amy? Okay. Hold on. How do you spell your, your last name? So, my last name is H U L M. Yeah. Um, which is not how it's pronounced. Does everybody butcher it? Yes, everybody. Okay. Um, except for a ninth grade physics teacher I had. Uh, my dad had had him as a student in class. Wow, that's perfect. So what do they call you in class here? Um, I just tell my students how to pronounce it. So they say, okay. Dr. Hall. And okay. I tell them, you get it wrong, we'll figure it out. <laughs> so how retroviruses and mobile genetic elements use the host cell to replicate? Um, and that's, we have a lot in common. That's what I was studying here <laughs> at Missouri State. And then Carly, I went to sociology after that. Uh, yeah, I said no. So, so you are the associate professor, program coordinator, clinical laboratory sciences, biomedical sciences. Um, so let, let's start from the beginning. So, so where where did you grow up? Um, I'm from Mexico. Okay. I'm from the Omaha area. So, were you, did you go to all the football games? Were you? A, Oh, you gotta put the mic up closer. Because I'm from Nebraska, I, I do love football. You either love football or hate football in Nebraska. Um, yeah, I'm kind of from the Omaha area. Okay. So, how, did you want to go to Michigan? Um, <laughs> that's a funny story. So, I went to I went to University of Nebraska Lincoln for undergrad, and my my freshman year um, was 1997. <laughs> Which is when Nebraska and Michigan share the national championship. Oh, yeah. So I did not want to go to Michigan, but they have they had a really I did after I learned about the program. So they had a really good graduate program that was an umbrella program where you could go in and pick what you wanted to study. And I was really interested in retroviruses, and they had a couple people who were into that in um, microbiology in the allergy. And then I was interested in human genetics that wasn't just cancer genetics. Um, and they had a really good department for that. So I ended up picking human genetics. So, so you didn't do that in elementary school? No, no, no. no. So, so tell me, in elementary school, were you one of those students that you know everybody went up to that had science questions and you knew all the, the answers of the science questions? Or, did, or was that not a deal for you then? Oh, it, it was. So um, so my mom uh, was a seventh grade biology teacher for 35 years. So she has since retired. I think sticking with seventh graders for 35 years is a special calling. It's a special age. <laughs> nice way of putting it. Right, right. 
So, um, so my mom loves science. Um, and I like science, and then I would get to do the science experiments that some of her students would do. So people are eating, but let's just say, um, and I have, I was going to say, I have like very little squeamishness because I'm a scientist, but um, like I dissected a cow eye at our kitchen table when oh, I was growing up because her students in her seventh grade class were doing it. And then when I was in college, I would come back over spring break and would go in and help with dissections in her class. So it was, science was always a thing that was around when I was growing up. So you didn't have to go buy those little science kits. You already had them. No, nope, no, nope, yeah. We would, you know, I'd go in and help my mom out, set up her room and kind of see what they were doing and get to play around with stuff. And then she'd bring stuff home. And I was very excited when I got yeah, yeah right of passage. Oh, yeah. It, it is for all of us, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. I think when one does. Uh, so, were you real good at math as well? I was. So my dad was a math teacher. Oh my gosh! Well, this is easy. <laughs> yeah. For thirty-three years, my brother yeah. ended up going into math. So I was good at math compared to my brother, who's very gifted at math. I did not think I was good at math, and then it took me until college. I was like, "Oh, I actually am good at math." But yeah. So when when you were in high school. Uh, is this what you wanted? He said, this is a career I want, yeah. or did you have some other ideas? No, I mean, I knew I wanted to do science. Um, for a brief time, I thought about being a veterinarian, because I really, I love animals. I had pets growing up. We had dog and various assorted rodents when I was growing up. I have cats now. Um, and then I did, like, a the Boy Scouts did an internship thing where you could go and um, kind of intern or at least maybe shadow would be a better word at a vet clinic. And I, I went into that and almost passed out while I was watching a surgery. Um, so, and then decided that, yeah, I didn't want to be a veterinarian. And so I wanted to go into science and be a scientist. And I wasn't quite sure how that would sort out, if that would be, you know, teaching and doing research or just doing research, going to biotech. But you know, you can have time to figure that out through college or grad school. So you didn't pass out on a cow eye. I did not pass out on a cow eye. So you no. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know what it was about it. Oh. So were you always inquisitive? I mean, is that just your nature? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, I think growing up, um, I did a program. I think it's changed. It was called Odyssey of the Mind. It's like 30 years ago, which was creative problem solving. Um, and science, if it's nothing else, is really just creative problem solving and trying to figure out why things work. Um, so there were some things that kind of helped that and fed into that. So after Michigan, you got your PhD, yep. what'd you do? Um, so then I went and did a postdoc, which is you have your PhD and you go work in somebody's lab and do research um, to kind of build up your research background skills and that type of thing. So um, I went to um, Tom Hope's lab at Northwestern University, um, which is in the medical campus of Northwestern in downtown Chicago. Um, and I studied HIV. So at that point, I kind of switched fields from hemogenics to retrovirus. So why? Why? Just because that was available or you actually wanted to explore that more? I did want to explore that more. So I had always found viruses interesting. Um, what I had been studying in grad school, mobile elements in some way are similar to viruses. Um, so that it, it was still kind of within my area. Um, I wanted to learn some different techniques um, to study viruses. And so in Tom's lab, um, they still do a lot of microscopy. Um, so using basically different types of very fancy and expensive microscopes um, to follow viral replication and how the virus is sort of spreading throughout the body, either in, in tissues or in whole animals or in cells, which is what I did. So by going there, it allowed me to, to get into viruses and then learn a bunch of new tools that I had not had chance to learn. Tell us who Tom is. Oh, so Tom was my advisor. So. Okay. Um, so Dr. Tom Hope at Northwestern. Um, so his, let's see, he's been there for, well, 
He's had his PhD for at least, he's had a lab for 20 years. I can't remember how long he's been at Northwestern, but so he was um, the principal investigator of that laboratory. Um, lab of about 20 to 30 people when I was there. So he would have graduate students in the lab um, and the postdocs like me. So the size kind of varied over time. Um, and the lab had a lot of different sort of aspects to it, which has become very helpful here. Um, because I teach a class on biology and HIV AIDS that the part that I do is a very small part of that class. So in Tom's lab, I got exposure to a lot of different aspects of the HIV AIDS epidemic that I probably wouldn't have if I would have gone somewhere else. And then how did you get to Missouri State? Um, so I, I wanted a position where I could teach and do research. Um, and even coming out of undergrad, this, this type of position was what I wanted. Um, I wanted to, to um, be faculty at a university. I wanted to, to teach and do research. And I, I wanted to teach undergraduate students too. Um, so I was, you know, looking around, I wanted to stay in the Midwest, um, interviewed places, and this seemed really like the best fit for me. So, um, in biomedical sciences, we're a, a human focused biology department, which is kind of what I and my research fits really well into, um, a lot of our students are going into healthcare, um, so especially for the class I teach on HIV and AIDS, I think that's a really important class for students going into healthcare um, to take. Um, so it just it just was a really good fit, kind of a location and, and type of position. Good, good, good. Yeah. So glad you did. So, yeah. so in layman's terms, especially for me to understand. Okay. <laughs> um, so the research you're doing. So tell us the implications of that and the importance of it. Okay. As 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 laymanish termish you can do. Okay. Um, so what makes viruses unique compared to bacteria, for example? So those can both cause disease. But what makes viruses unique is that they they have to get inside one of our cells to make more copies of themselves. That's what replication is, is just to make more copies and cause disease. Um, and what's interesting is that HIV, for example, only has sort of 15 proteins. So these are like the machinery of the virus that's going to allow it to make more copies of itself. Um, so the rest of what it uses are cellular proteins. So our cellular components to help it copy itself and spread. Um, so in my lab, that, that's what I got the grant for, was to look at one cellular protein and how it's affecting the ability of that virus to infect the cell, make more copies of itself so you can have infection spread. Um, so how this plays into the HIV AIDS epidemic is if we're going to develop better drugs or stop the virus from spreading, we need to better understand how it does that at the cellular level. So what, what cellular proteins it uses, because then those become targets for drugs, for example, um, to block the virus from using those proteins. Still an epidemic. Still yes. an epidemic, yep, still ongoing. Yeah, and the no cure yet. Nope, well, there have been three people that have been cured of HIV. And how so? Oh boy. Um, so it's not a cure that you would want in like any random person that is HIV positive to, to undertake. And that's because we have very good drug treatments right now. But um, so all three individuals um, were HIV positive um, and then developed a type of leukemia. And to treat their leukemia, um, a stem cell transplant was their best option. So they went through with the stem cell transplant, but the cells that they implanted um, contain a change in them that is naturally occurring in the human population to make those cells resistant to HIV infection. Um, so there's this um, allele called CCR5 delta 32. If somebody has two copies of that, um, they cannot be infected by HIV. 
Um, so the, the first person that did this, his name is, was Timothy Ray Brown. He passed away a few years ago. Um, he was called the Berlin patient for a long time because that's where he was living. He was American living in Berlin. Um, and it's, I tell my students, we talk about this in my class, it's kind of amazing because the, the prevalence of that um, CCR5 Delta 32 allele um, is highest in the population in north, areas of like Northern Europe. And so the fact that he was in Berlin is probably what made this possible. Um, so all three individuals have gone through that same process is that this stem cell transplant is done with cells that are resistant to HIV infection. And so it basically replaces a normal immune system with one that's resistant and then that cures HIV. Um, but yes, there is no cure available, very good drug treatments, no vaccine available. So it's still very much an ongoing pandemic. So this type of research you're doing, mm -hmm. how much is going on now in universities like mm -hmm. ours? The stuff that you're doing, is there increases, decreases? Is there still um, that interest in the, in the research? Uh, and is it getting better and better? Yeah, I would say there's still a lot of HIV research. Um, <clears throat> simply because it is an ongoing <laughs> pandemic. Um, I mean, what is it? I'm trying to remember worldwide how many new infections there are from HIV per year. I think it's about 2 million. Um, and so research can be aimed more at developing new drug treatments, developing a vaccine, developing a cure, or um, developing better prevention techniques. So you decrease the number of new HIV infections per year. And, and your grant came from where again? National Institutes of Health. Uh, and yeah. and how, that was a big grant. It was, yeah. It was really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so when when do you report back? Or is that still an ongoing right. process? Right. It's still an ongoing process. So it's, it's a three-year grant. Um, it's not renewable as far as I know. So I'd have to apply for a new one if I would want another one. Um, it's a granting program that NIH has developed um, specifically for institutions like this, um, where you're focused on more on undergraduate and graduate education in some areas, um, and you don't, you know, have like a large medical school associated with you or something like that. Um, and the focus is on, it's on the research that you perform, but also providing good research opportunities for undergraduates, because we know that contributes toward future scientists. That all, that's also a lot of my students have gone to medical school or PA school, um, but that will make them more scientifically literate, you know, as far as the research side of things go as, as doctors or PAs moving forward. Um, so I put in a progress report that actually will be due December 1st, so I should start working on that. Uh, <laughs> every year, um, and then any, how I report the results would be to write up that information in a scientific paper and submit that to a journal, <laughs> except that it gets published, and that's how it's shared with the scientific community. So do you have conversations with other researchers doing similar type work all over the country? Are you guys yeah. share uh, data, share, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and is that a close community? It is. So um, there's a meeting I go to, usually, well, either every year or every other year called the Cold Spring Harbor Retroviruses meeting. Mm -hmm. It's held in Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, New York. Um, and I've been going, I don't know, since I started in Tom's lab. So I think the first year I went was 2010. Um, and it's on retroviruses, but most of the work is on HIV. And it's kind of the level and area at which I study HIV, so how it replicates the cells. So um, you do have presentations, either talks or poster presentations to share data with others in the field. Um, if you get an interesting result, you can always shoot somebody an email or give them a call, or I guess now jump on Zoom. We all use Zoom all the time or everything um, to kind of collaborate with other people in the field or see if they're seeing the same thing. Um, Part of government funding is sharing reagents as well. So 
um, some of the, like the cell lines that we have in the lab, I got from other labs. The um, plasmids that we use to make virus came from other labs and other institutions. And so, so in that way, we also share as well. So during the middle of all this, then then COVID happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then was that something you wanted to study? Did they come to you and say, hey, can you help us with this? Or was that just like, oh man, this is a... <laughs> This is fun. It's, it, I mean, it was fun. It was a weird, so actually how I got involved with the wastewater testing here is I got an email from Mark Johnson at University of Missouri. And the first email was, hey, Amy, do you do qPCR? I'm like, why is, and I, Mark studies HIV. I had met him at the Colter's Harbor Retroviruses meeting, didn't know him that well, but I talked to him and wondered why he was emailing me about this technique. And then the follow-up email said, you know, we're doing wastewater testing for the state. MSU wants to expand testing, but we don't have the capability to do it. So, so what do you think? And so I jumped on a Zoom call with Mark um, and we talked about it. And then um, at the same time, I, was, I got an email from, I think it was David, Vaughn, like, do you think we can do this? Like, well, funny you mention it. Mark, just talk to Mark. And I think we can. So um, kind of my background in virology and that other QPCR technique. Um, yeah, I could get the protocol from Mark and follow what they did. And um, we, I did not collect the wastewater <laughs> myself. Uh, <laughs> David Vaughn was responsible for you know, going into manhole covers and things like that. But... My boss wanted me to do that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he did ask me to do that a couple of times. Yeah, he was like, uh, um, yeah, you do that. But, but, but that was important. That was a very important scientific discovery, yes? It, well, to it, help us. To help, yeah. Yes. And it was it was nice to be able to do something to help. Because yeah. there was so much going on. And there's, you know, yeah. very limited amount that I could do yeah. um, and so that was it was a great thing to be able to do to help out and, just and that went I mean cities and other organizations do that type of testing yeah time. yeah as far as I know Mark is still doing it for the state of Missouri um, I know anytime it seems like there's a like a New York Times article or something on wastewater testing they're talking to Mark so He's kind of become one of the, the national experts on wow, it. That's and good. Doing it. Yeah. We, we've got some, and we're going to bring him up here in a second, uh, but we have some pictures that uh, we oh, always, yeah. we'd like to have just to, to learn just a little bit more uh, about you. And uh, so, and uh, so this is, yeah. So There's this was what, five, six years ago? Oh, yeah. That's, that's a long time. And uh, what, what, what's, did you read so, a bunch? I love to read. Yeah. And I love animals. So that's why I included that one. So yeah, I think I'm like 10 or 11. Um, and that's our guinea pig cocoa. Because again, we had various assorted rodents. So you probably had scientific journals all over the house. Right? I did not, no. Oh. no. And it, even for now, I actually, like for reading for me for fun, I tend to read science fiction and fantasy because I have to read so much nonfiction. Like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and scientific there. reading in my, my normal sort of daily that's life. So. Good picture. Okay. There you are. Where's this? This is me at University of Nebraska Lincoln. So that was, I started doing research as an undergrad. Um, I was in a lab at a fly lab that studied Drosophila. So yeah, isolating RNA from flies, which looking back, I'm like, wow, I can't believe they handled, handed me RNA isolation as an undergraduate, which my undergraduates do, but still it's a whole thing. Anyway. Well, you're in a happy place. So let's go there. Yeah. Oh, we've already done that one. Oh, go forward there. Uh, there. Yeah, so this is graduation um, when I got my PhD. From oh, you guys have been proud. Yeah, with my parents and my brother. Oh, they're yes. proud. I know so that. we're all very smiling. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is me with the lab that I did my postdoc in. Um, so the, the person kind of, I'm in the front with the green hat. And um, then the person behind me, that's Tom. So that's my postdoc advisor. And then Two other postdocs from the lab. So Tom must be famous too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom is very well known. This was at a, a meeting in Banff, um, Canada, um, kind of centered on viral entry and viral replication. So occasionally we do fun things. Yeah, we got to. Meetings. Yeah, okay. 
This is me at the Cold Spring Harbor Retrovirus this meeting um, with some colleagues. But in the center, um, that's uh, uh, James Watson of Watson and Crick that oh. discovered the structure of DNA. Oh, wow. Yeah. So up until recently, he was the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. Um, and when that meeting is held, you, you stay on that campus and, and eat in their dining hall. And we were eating dinner one evening, and he just came in to have dessert. So we all got our picture. Oh, I thought that was a neat yeah. experience. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, <clears throat> this might, okay. No idea why you put this picture. I think so. Yeah. I think, <laughs> and I tell my students this too, I think it's important to have ways to de-stress. In, in your life. So in grad school, I started knitting and crocheting. Um, yeah, so this is this is a chicken in Chiefs colors, go Chiefs, uh, that I made my nephew last Christmas. And then the other reason I included it is it's made out of, Ella's going to start laughing, it's made out of um, hexagons and pentagons. And um, HIV has this capsid structure that's essentially made out of hexagons and pentagons. And so the same way you get changes in shape in this chicken is the same way you get changes in shape in wow. HIV capsid, which is super <laughs> really, really cool. That is cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then. And then this one I included because oh, okay. so those are my cats. Um, <laughs> they like each other. They do. Um, so one, I love animals, and then two, with COVID and teaching from home and on Zoom, I think all students have met my cats when I'm at home on Zoom at some point. And when we had to, you know, kind of move everything on campus, this is what happened a lot at home. They became my coworkers and would often be sleeping or trying to type. And what's their name? Pumpkin is the dark orange one yep. and Patch is the light orange one. Right. I did not name them the rescue that they came from. Thank uh, you. That's good. Emma, come on up. Emma, Emma Wise uh, uh, was a... Uh, a former student, is that right? Yeah. So where where are you from? I'm from Northern Illinois, originally. And how did you get to Missouri State? I did my undergrad and graduate at Missouri State. I came here because I was a recipient of the Presidential Scholarship. And so what are you doing now? Currently, I am getting my CV and resume ready to start applying to different research labs across the country. What do you want to do? Uh, so I would like to go into research. It's such a broad topic that I'm still kind of discovering exactly what I would like to go into. So tell me about Amy's classes. I mean, uh, <laughs> that, uh, be nice. Uh, be nice. <laughs> but but uh, what are the, uh, well, one, did she inspire you? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Dr. Holm is, I would say, one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever met but also very humble about that knowledge. Uh, any, I think any question I've ever had, she's had an answer that if there is an answer, if there's not an answer, <laughs> then very good at figuring out different ways we can, I guess, understand why um, we see what's happening is happening. <laughs> so research-wise, I mean, uh, you, you, and you took the, the classes, all the, how many classes did you take with her? Um, I took, Biomolecular interactions, HIV class, and personalized medicine. Is there an area uh, from the HIV standpoint that that uh, did that open up more questions for you? Did it open up? Hey, I want to do this, or uh, how did that that work in your mind in terms of what you want to do for research? I think it's really helped me to see that. From my standpoint, doing research is the best way to help the most amount of people. Um, similar to lots of people that go into the cell molecular biology program, I'm passionate about helping people. And I think going into research, and I really saw this in the HIV class, that discovering different parts of uh, an unknown really helps a broad variety of people um, compared to individual help uh, in, say, like PA school. Awesome. Um, and then uh, do you want to stick around this area or is it, hey, wherever, wherever jobs take you? It's kind of wherever jobs take me. Um, I came to Missouri State in 2017 for my undergrad. 
uh, and it was a big jump to move so far. Uh, it's about an eight and a half, nine hour drive uh, to my parents. And so I think it may be time for a change, maybe a little closer to mom and dad for a little while, um, to kind of see wherever it takes me. Go to Tom's lab, maybe, and she'll hook you up with Tom's lab there. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Um, uh, so now we're going to, you can stick up here and you can actually uh, help her out because we're going to go into the lightning round uh, where uh, this water pops in your mind. Okay. Uh, and and then, then we're going to see what questions you have out there. Okay. Your favorite food? Favorite ever? Yeah. My mom's spaghetti. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That's a good answer. My mom makes really good, like, meat sauce. That, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, then your favorite restaurant in Springfield. Oh, I really like Civil Kitchen. Oh, yeah. Just down the street. I mean, any place that you can have donuts for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> like it's on the menu and it's okay. It's not going to give you a weird look. Yeah. Favorite building on campus? I'll say Camp Peter because we've been Yay. recently renovated. Yeah. Especially and now. yeah, I was going to say this time last year, it looks very different than it did this time last year. So, yeah. Books or movies? Oh, uh, books. Yeah. I love movies, but books. Winter or summer? Winter. Oh. Wow. Yeah. I'm not that I'm disappointed, but, but I why mean, would you say that? No. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like fall. Fall is my favorite season. Yeah. So I, I yeah, like summer gets too hot. Winter, you can always put on more clothes to stay warm. And summer, at some point, you're just hot. <laughs> and you were used to it growing up in Nebraska, right? I, I like Michigan. Yeah, you know? and Chicago. you're used to it too. I mean, you're you're in the Northland here. Yeah. So you're a summer or winter. Yeah, oh gosh, okay. I gotta talk to you people after this. <laughs> quiet time or busy time? Uh, I'd say quiet time. Yeah. Oh, good. Country or pop music? Oh. Um, you can say neither. I would say neither. Really? What yeah. music do you listen to? I do like classic rock or um, like folk type oh, alternative good. stuff. Good. Yeah. We got that. Okay. Magazines, People Magazine or Scientific American Magazine? Oh, I would say Scientific American. Yeah. Early morning person, late night person. Late night person. Emma knows that. Emma's also not an early morning person, but yeah. <laughs> so are your classes all in the evening? No, they're like at 11 <laughs> is when my name is. Is that early? Is. That's not early. Oh, okay. No, okay. But it's not unusual to get an email from me maybe like midnight, like... Yeah. And you stay up late, I'm sure, studying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, teaching or research? Oh. Mm. I don't think I can pick. Honestly, you have to. Yeah. I do? <laughs> yeah, have to. <laughs> but see, there's elements in both. Okay. Because, like, a lot of the research I do now is, so I'll just say research, because a lot of the uh, research I do now is teaching the students how to do research. So there's a huge teaching component in research. And then in my classes, we talk about research. So I think they go hand in hand and they shouldn't have to pick one. Okay, well, I guess, <laughs> I guess you're the genius. You can do that. <laughs> what questions do you have out here? We've got uh, for minutes and also those online. You can type in your question. Yes, sir. Mike. Amy, you mentioned you teach a course called HIV and AIDS. I do, yes. Forgive my ignorance. What's the difference? Oh, so HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. Um, so, so somebody can be HIV positive, um, if they're not on medication, it takes um, about eight to 10 years for AIDS to develop. Um, so HIV infects cells that um, are important in the immune system for um, basically communication system of the immune system. Um, so HIV infection will kill off those cells over time. So after eight to 10 years, enough of those cells have died off that the immune system is really very crippled. Um, and that person becomes susceptible to sort of common infections um, that are a normal functioning immune system would deal with. Um, we also see increased risk of, of cancers. Um, so once individuals have one of those, what we call opportunistic infections, then they're at that AIDS 
stage. Um, so people can be HIV positive without having AIDS. Um, and then the medications that we have um, basically allow people to, as long as they're taken correctly, never get to that AIDS stage. How long have you been teaching that class? Or how long have we had that class here? It's been here. So I've been teaching it since I got here. I actually taught it my first semester. Um, and it was here, I mean, I think it started in like the 1990s. It started way before me. Um, yeah, when I started teaching it, we had, um, there were a couple of, of eye infectious disease doctors from Mercy that came in and taught it with me. Um, their schedules became a little bit more difficult to schedule the class. And so then I would still have one, um, Dr. Sistrunk at Mercy would come in and give a guest lecture. I have not bothered him since COVID hit because I figure he's probably really busy. So I'm thinking maybe maybe next semester I'll reach out and see if he can come in and give a guest lecture again, or maybe we can just do something on Zoom too, because um, his perspective with the students is always really interesting. Other questions? Yes. What makes it so difficult to develop a vaccine for HIV? Oh, I love this question. I'm as big as my class. She I'm not a plant. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I think your class, the, the HIV class, began yes. as an intercession class. Oh, years long ago. time ago. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I just it was, it was like a six to eight week. Okay. I mean, it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the reason we don't have vaccine, right? Yes. Okay. Um, there's a couple things. So one, HIV mutates really rapidly. Um, so. COVID right now, we're seeing all these COVID variants. That is nothing compared to the amount of mutation that HIV can go through. So that is one big difficulty. If you're gonna develop a vaccine, it has to be effective against all of that genetic diversity, which is very wide. And even within an individual, they can have a lot of genetic diversity. <laughs> to me, the biggest thing is that, um, we don't know if our immune system can clear HIV infection. So we do not have an example of a person that was HIV positive that is now HIV negative. That person would be really hard to find to begin with, but um, vaccines really just train the immune system to clear an infection. And if our immune system can't clear HIV infection, then a vaccine might not work. Um, so I think those are the two biggest things is the genetic diversity. And then again, we just don't know if the immune system is capable of doing it. Do you think there'll be a cure in your lifetime? I mean, I think there could be a cure. I think, um, I think with CRISPR, that's a gene editing technology that can go in. I think that shows a lot of promise for a cure. Uh, that, I mean, there's been a lot of very smart people working on an HIV vaccine for almost 40 years now. Like the first vaccine trial, I think, was in 1987, maybe. Um, and they're starting to get really creative. So I, I would hope we could come up with a vaccine, but I'm less optimistic on that than I am on a cure eventually. Uh, yeah, just, just your take on Okay. Yeah, so um, whether the virus is living or not. So um, it kind of depends on how you define a living thing. Um, so if you, if you open up a biology textbook, there's usually anywhere from five to nine characteristics of living things, depending on how they combine them. So the thing that all viruses don't follow is the ability to independently reproduce. So all living things can independently reproduce which is why a cell is a basic unit of living things. Um, and viruses can't do that. So when it comes right down to it, therefore viruses aren't alive. So when I talk about viruses in class, when we go over how viruses replicate, I don't ever say they have a life cycle because that implies they're alive. And technically they don't meet that requirement for being alive. Whether they're alive or not, they cause a lot of problems, so we kind of have to deal with them. So at some point, it just comes down to semantics. But 
there are still, I was at a meeting um, a couple years ago where there were a couple researchers going, so wait, are we saying they're alive or not alive? <laughs> so it's it's still very much under debate because it doesn't meet that requirement. Okay. What what is our campus doing to prevent AIDS from increasing? Um, so I think as far as um, so outreach to students, I mean, I think the health center on campus has good information for students. Um, I know in the class I teach, we talk about one of, I shouldn't say that because it's usually a quiz question, but I usually ask the students, like, what do they think they could do to improve awareness on campus? Um, and, and they say, make them take this class. Says, well, but I'm not going to teach this class to the entire campus. So, um, you know, I think testing is available for students. I think, um, especially around December 1st is World AIDS Day. So there's usually some information or opportunities for information that goes out to the students as well. Um, I think education in general is a huge part of it. I know I will get students into the class that at the end of class will think, oh, I didn't think this was a problem anymore, or I thought there was a cure, or I thought only certain types of people could get HIV and AIDS. And so, um, I, th I mean, I, I went to school during the 1980s when HIV had just come about and it was still a big problem and there wasn't good drugs. And so I think maybe it has dropped back a little bit as far as education and information. And, um, but I think at Missouri State, we're, we're offering opportunities for students to get informed. Other questions? Anyone? We've talked about, uh, will there be an end to it? Yeah. So let's go way back. Have we always had HIV AIDS or did that really develop when it all blew up in the 80s? So it blew up before the 80s. So um, they've gone back in and um, they've been able to test old like blood and tissue samples. And now because we know of this, you know, basically eight to 10 year lag between when somebody's infected to when you can see signs of the disease. We know it had to be in the US before the 1980s. Um, so based on all the available information, we know that the virus started off in chimpanzees. Um, and in chimpanzees, it's called, the closely related virus is called SIV, so simian immunodeficiency virus. Um, we think it jumped into humans from um, bushmeat hunting. So humans hunting um, chimps and gorillas um, for food um, in this region of Africa where human populations were expanding and overlapping into the natural ranges of those chimpanzees. Um, and then from there, it spread throughout the world. So in the 1980s, when we were seeing the first AIDS patients in the United States, that was happening everywhere else. Um, and actually, the virus was identified in the U.S. and in France in a lab there at the same time. Um, so it definitely did come here, um, probably in like the 1960s, 1970s. Um, they can, again, there's some limited like tissue and blood samples that they can go back in and test. And we know it was here before then, um, but it's thought to have jumped from chimpanzees and then there's kind of some lesser known that came from gorilla. Anyway, um, maybe like 1900s, 1910s, 1920s is when we think it, it made that jump into humans. Yes. You mentioned it mutates so fast. Is that because it's been around 50, 60 years now? And will COVID mutate faster as it goes? Is that, is, is that um, lead up? So, wait, I guess? yeah, I mean, so you'd expect. Not necessarily, time could be a factor. Yeah. Um, for HIV, the reason it mutates so rapidly is that um, the enzyme that it uses to replicate its genome is error prone, which you would think would be a terrible idea. You're like, okay, the, you know, the genetic material that codes for what that virus is going to be, you don't think you'd want it to change. It just turns out that HIV makes so many copies, it can be tolerant to that change. So. The mutation rate for HIV is more due to um, that protein that it uses to make its genome rather than time. Um, but as we're seeing with COVID, like as more time goes on, you'd expect there to 
And the more that virus circulates, because it's still very present and is still circulating, you would expect to see more changes. Because again, you just, like you said, you just have more chance for that to happen given more time. Okay. Yes. Perhaps I'm the only one who didn't know what was it QCPR? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, oh, so what is what PCR? Is <laughs> All right. So, um, so PCR itself um, stands for polymerase chain reaction because in polymerase chain reaction. So, in science, we have to abbreviate everything. It drives my students crazy. Um, so that was a technique that was developed in the 1980s um, to make a lot of copies of DNA. Um, and then we use it now for a lot of different things. So um, to test for, for COVID, we can go in and attempt to make a lot of copies of certain parts of the COVID genome. And if we can, then we know that the COVID genome is there. Um, the Q part is quantitative. So you can design that assay in a way that you can say, okay, in this sample, we have 10 copies. In this sample, we have 10,000 copies. So it's just a kind of a variation on that original technique that allows us to count it um, much more accurately. Yeah. I was going to say that too, but I think that made it. Yes. Um, how much do federal restrictions I think it's, I'm not an expert. I think it depends on the type of research. Um, so I know for some, I want to say for some HIV vaccine research that did vaccine research or cure research. Oh, shoot. Let's see. Maybe both. Um, so there's some mouse models. Um, that they had to stop using because of that. Um, I've never really worked with stem cells, um, so I can't tell you what like an impact on, on my research it would be, but I know that has, for research in general, it has kind of limited to certain cell lines that could be used or, or ways in which those certain tissues could be used to, to model sort of more complex human biology. Okay. One more question, yes. Go ahead. No, nope, you go ahead. You go ahead. What's the mechanism to share your research with drug companies? Oh, with drug companies. So um, it primarily would be through publication. Um, so writing up that research in a paper that they would read or at a meeting. Um, so at scientific meetings, you typically either present on a poster or in a talk research that is not published. Um, so that's part of the benefit of going to the conference is you get to see kind of the new, new information that's out there. Um, so drug companies could, you know, send somebody to those meetings um, or read the papers and then kind of contact. Um, there are some labs in the field that have more direct relationships um, set up with drug companies. So one of the steps in replication that we study in my lab, there's no drug against it. Um, so I know a, a researcher in the field when I was a postdoc, he was partnering with Pfizer to try to develop a drug to target that step. So um, his lab was involved with kind of screening those drug compounds. So, so again, in the broader field, you can set up those partnerships and kind of work together or drug companies can take that information and then use that in drug development later on. Very good. Emma, thank you for being here and wish you the best uh, in your future. I'm glad that you were inspired. That's the great thing when our students are inspired by our faculty. We all have stories like that where one person makes a difference and then Emma goes out and makes a difference in a lot of people's lives as well. And Amy, we're glad that you are our genius. Uh, we're <laughs> glad that you came from, uh, from Michigan and now are a bear. Uh, yeah. and, and we appreciate you being uh, with your service uh, on this particular topic, but service to Missouri State students. We thank both of you for being here, and thanks again for being here with Lunch with the Genius.